All right. So our final speaker for the session will be Mike, and he'll be talking to us about modeling common envelope evolution in SPH. All right, thanks. Let's clip this. All right, um, I'm Mike Lyle. I'm a PhD student at Monash University, and my supervisors are um, uh, Rio, who is also here, and uh, Daniel, and also uh, Ilya, whom I do not see yet. Um, but I'm about to finish up. I have less than a month before I submit uh, my thesis. And today I'll be talking about uh, my focus in uh, hydro modeling and using Phantom, which is to model so called uh, common envelope phase. So it's nice to hear yesterday and both today about some mentions of the importance of stellar multiplicity that stars are in uh, binaries, triples, or high order systems. And uh, they're quite important. And also from earlier this morning to hear about the importance of massive stars. And because uh, these are the two things I'm quite interested in uh, in the context of common envelope evolution. Uh, so we've seen this plot uh, already before, but I shall sh show again that it shows that as we go to higher masses, the st uh, stellar multi multiplicity becomes a more and more common phenomenon. Uh, particularly, this shows that the average number of companions uh, really starts exceeding one above two solar masses. And for uh, even more massive uh, stars, uh, triples become uh, dominant. And not only um, do st are stars often in these higher order systems, they also often undergo interactions with each other. So for example, this plot here taken from SANA 2012 shows that binary interactions dominate the outcome of massive star evolutions up to 70% in uh, this plot here. So stars can undergo interactions where they exchange mass with each other, they could uh, accrete and spin up with each other, they could, they could merge and form a single merger product. And this diversity of stellar interactions is illustrated by this rather uh, intimidating diagram here that shows really uh, all the types of interactions that can proceed from a, uh, an initial pair of main sequence binary stars, eventually undergoing all these interactions, mass transfer, common envelopes, uh, supernovae and binaries, forming a variety of uh, compact binaries, uh, such as binary black holes, double neutron stars, these could be gravitational wave sources. You could form X-ray binaries. Uh, you could form progenitors of type 1a supernovae, uh, hot subdwarf stars, uh, planetary nebulae, and many more. And in particular, uh, the common envelope phase is a very central part of many of these processes, in, particularly, uh, in particular for forming um, um, tight compact binaries. However, it is also one of the most uh, uncertain uh, processes in binary evolution, uh, despite its importance. And so I'll first uh, briefly describe what the common envelope phase entails. So it starts when you have a binary stellar system in which a companion star, which is also called the accretor, enters the envelope of an ex uh, the extended envelope of a giant star, which is also called the donor because it's losing mass to the companion. Uh, this could uh, be due to a variety of reasons, including uh, a tidal instability that drives the binary to shrink in a runaway process like the Darwin instability. It could occur uh, more generally when you have mass transfer in the system from the donor to the accretor, but it occurs in a, uh, in a runaway uh, process in which the more mass that's lost, the uh, more the separation shrinks and more, more mass uh, exceeds the rush lobe of the donor. So the material would pile up around the orbit, uh, engulfing both um, stellar companions. So what happens next once the companion enters the giant envelope is the start of the so-called dynamical phase or spiral end of the common envelope. And here you start from a wide orbit and shrink to a very tight binary orbit because drag forces uh, take away the orbital energy and angular momentum of your two stars and deposits them in the envelope. And if enough energy is deposited, you could possibly 
expel the envelope. Um, and if not, you would end up with the merger of the two stellar cores inside the common envelope. And so the result is that we take a large uh, binary star and we shrink it to a tight orbit. And the donor star now becomes a strip star. It's only a stellar core. So many detailed simulations have been performed to uh, study this phase. And the key questions uh, often from these simulations is whether we can uh, simulate the full complete ejection of the common envelope. And if we do, what is the final separation um, of the binary? Because as I said, the final separation uh, uh, determines properties of obser many observed systems. And for example, for gravitational wave sources, if your system is too wide after a common envelope, it might not be able to merge via gravitational radiation within the Hubble time, and so would not become viable gravitational wave sources. Uh, so I've shown a variety of pictures from different papers, mostly from recent years, years to illustrate uh, various simulations that have been done. Particularly, there are a bunch of SPH simulations that have also been shown. So these, the ones with the phantom logo, uh, are made with Phantom, and the uh, PASI 2012 and Iaconi 2017 papers have also used SPH, but uh, not with Phantom. Uh, this is work by Miguel uh, over here, and he would tell us more about that and possibly uh, his extensions of this work uh, later in the week. Um, how a modeling common envelope is uh, usually very difficult. It is a inherently a multidimensional process and it could involve a variety of physics. So we, we know that hydrodynamics, self-gravity uh, is definitely important and possibly also radiation transport, turbulence, nuclear reactions, dust jets, and magnetic fields. This is also a problem with an extreme dynamic range up to eight orders of magnitude. And all of these simulations um, have, been quite, have not been successful in unbinding the entire envelope self-consistently unless extra energy sources like recombination energy are added. And on the top right corner, that's uh, uh, a snapshot from my own simulations in the work published uh, last year involving a red supergiant donor, uh, which is 12 solar masses in an orbit of a companion that is um, either three solar masses or 1.26 solar masses. So we have two different cases simulated. And a companion is represented by a non-accreting sink particle in phantom. Well, this one has a movie as well. So here we're looking at the spiral in of the common envelope. And so this is a movie from my own, uh, from the simulation I've uh, just described from my work last year. So we're looking at a 3D surface rendering of the red supergiant star. So we begin the setup with the uh, with the donor star overflowing its Roche lobe and therefore transferring material onto the companion. The material sits on a small disk around the companion, eventually driving outflows. The loss of angular momentum causes the orbit to shrink, and eventually the companion is about to enter the envelope, which is the start of the dynamical plunge in phase. So I'll now play the remainder of the evolution that occurs inside the envelope and therefore is not quite well seen uh, by this video, but you can see that a lot of material is expelled dynamically. So here's another view. We're looking at now, uh, now at density cross sections. Um, on the left, we have a face-on cross section, and on the right, we are looking at the, uh, an edge-on view of the system. So this actually reminds me a lot of uh, some of the simulations I've seen yesterday. Um, of the post AGB star outflows, because we see a similar spiral structure generated as the companion drives a bow shock through the envelope. And I'll briefly, um, and part of my talk, I'll be um, summarizing how we have evolved in Phantom in our in the, the workflow for setting up common envelope simulations and bits of new physics or procedures we have invented along the way to make this. Um, uh, um, an easier process and, and more uh, accurate process. So the first step is uh, to set up a giant star in Phantom. So we already have a star setup that easily allows us to do that. 
And this involves firstly mapping a 1D stellar profile into a 3D computational domain of phantom. So the 1D stellar profile could be supplied by a stellar evolution code like Mesa or Kepler. And we, we are able to read uh, both these formats and also another format. The next step is uh, to relax the star. What this means is that once we've mapped the star into a distribution of SPH particles, um, it's not guaranteed to be in, in a perfectly relaxed uh, uh, condition. It's not perfectly in hydrostatic equilibrium because of a uh, finite number of particles. And so what's often done is to um, evolve the star in isolation to allow the particles to relax and generate clean initial conditions for a common envelope. The next step is to add a companion to our single star. Um, we've mostly been using uh, companions represented by a sync particle, but um, in principle, the R binary mod dump could also now um, add another star uh, from a different phantom dump file with the caveat that the uh, particles mass are assumed to be the same. Uh, the third step is to run phantom. So again, um, common envelope is a problem that requires self-gravity. We often also use global time stepping, which makes it a quite an, uh, an expensive simulation to perform. And that's because we require quite good um, um, angular momentum and energy conservation in, uh, in this problem. And this is often uh, uh, becomes, the non-conservation often becomes larger than, uh, than, than desired if we run the simulations for quite long. So these simulations often take one to few months of wall time. And in my simulations, I actually turn off the artificial conductivity. Uh, artificial conductivity. And finally, in Phantom, we have a suite of analysis uh, subroutines and modules uh, fr from this analysis common envelope file. And uh, it's mainly written by Tom Reichardt, Roberto Arconi, uh, myself, and Miguel. And it contains subroutines for analyzing the amount of unbound mass, in the simulation, the energy profile of the common envelope and studying, for example, the gravitational drag in the system. Uh, so I'll dive a bit deeper into this. So in terms of setting up a single star, um, sort of the standard uh, in, this, in the previous phantom simulations before my own PhD, uh, what we've done is that we map a bunch of SPH particles into, into a, a sphere, into a lattice, and we stretch it to give the desired density profile. Um, and then we relax by evolving the star in isolation with a velocity damping term. However, we see, for example, that in this star generated here, there are these features, uh, artificial features that sort of reminds me of, of this, um, which has led to a comment, and I see Ilya has just entered, uh, that phantom could simulate a pizza and the next version could, uh, with, has an option of choosing the toppings. So what, so what ha is happening here is that this lattice that we've been using um, is a quite relaxed configuration, but it has these uh, symmetry axes that would persist as you evolve the star in, in uh, isolation. So what we've done instead is that we've implement, we're, we're now prefer to use a random uniform sphere. So we place particles in a Monte Carlo fashion uh, with also symmetric particle placement to conserve uh, linear momentum. And so that results in a more noisy density profile as shown in the lower right, but it would quickly relax into the desired uh, density profile shown in the red line very quickly. And we've also used a relaxation procedure um, that allows the entire profile to relax on its local stability, uh, stable time scale so that the inner part the central particles, despite um, having, um, uh, sorry, the outer particles, despite having much longer dynamical times, uh, dynamical times would also be able to relax efficiently compared to the inner particles. And also uh, previously we've been, um, as I've mentioned yesterday, perhaps with red giant stars, they're very dense cores. So that's density profile shown in blue here. And so we simply chop it off and replace it with a softened profile and a sink particle core in the middle. So that softened density profile is shown here. Um, but currently in, in my, uh, what this leads to is that um, when a giant star is mapped into phantom, 
it would actually want to drive convection. And so we see a transient convection here, but because this convection is not driven by uh, a central source, it dies out after a few turnovers. So since this really affects our ability to generate clean initial conditions, we've later opted to um, completely generate a flat entropy star to suppress this convection. Let me skip ahead because I'm low on time. We've also implemented a few equations of state uh, for simulating uh, red supergiants, including one that includes gas and radiation, one that includes uh, recombination energy tabulated from MESA, that's implemented by Tom. And more recently, we're using analytical fits of recombination energy instead. And, and this does play a role in, uh, in common envelope evolution because depending on the equation of state, we assume the final separation of the stellar cores seen in this region here uh, could be quite different. And that relates to the fact that with different equations of state, the effective binding energy of your envelope is different. And so the stellar cores uh, would have to inspiral less, for example, to eject a more loosely bound envelope. That's shown by the green curve here, for example, in an equation of state that includes recombination energy. And the same goes with the amount of unbound mass. So I've mentioned we don't eject the entire envelope, but the amount, the fraction of unbound envelope mass increases as we include recombination. And uh, finally, I'd also like to talk about light curves. So common envelopes are associated with um, these optical transients called luminous red novae, which have luminosities intermediate that uh, intermediate of that of uh, supernovae and classical uh, novae. And here I've shown a bunch of light curves from different luminous red nova. And this is an example of, um, of an image of the V838 mon uh, stellar merger that's observed by the uh, HST that shows the aftermath of, um, of a luminous red nova. So we've also tried to look at look into light curves by pro, uh, post-processing my simulations with MCFOST uh, to generate a, this light curve here. So we get roughly the right uh, values of luminosities in the beginning and at the peak. However, the luminosity is just too high at late times just because our common envelope is unable to cool. We don't have any radiative cooling. And um, finally, I'll also briefly talk about um, that I've also been able to make simulations of planetary engulfment more recently. The difference in terms of setup is that we have a planet in spiraling into a red giant engulfed by a red giant, and the planet is also modeled as a gas sphere instead of a sink particle. And that's important because um, the drag here is mediated by the ram pressure of the incident flow onto the planet. And so we have to capture the physical size of the planet. And I'll end with a few uh, future outlook. Uh, I think to move forward in, in uh, simulating common envelopes, we must include radiation transport. Um, this will allow us to self-consistently model the injection of recombination energy. It would allow us to drive convection instead of artificially suppressing it and allow us to follow, uh, calculate uh, light curves um, with an uh, envelope that's able to cool. Um, I've also mentioned briefly using a boundary particle stellar core yesterday, which would allow us to study the rotation of the core and maybe we could unfreeze the core later on to continue the evolution of a deeper in spiral. And finally, optimization and MPI scaling would always be good. We could have higher resolution, more particles, and we could simulate, uh, make longer simulations. And that's all for me, thank you. Thanks for the great talk, Mike. Do we have any questions? Hi, Mike. Um, I'm just curious, with the, the red supergiants and the, the common envelope, does your red supergiant model have any mass loss, like separate to the common envelope? So do you mean in the 1D model used to provide the initial conditions or in the code itself? Well, either. OK. So. Um, in the code itself, there's no um, no extra mass loss of the of the red supergiant on its own. Um, that's because we want to generate stable initial conditions, and the this mass loss is really driven by by the surface luminosity of the star, which is also something not captured in 
in a hydrodynamical simulation. And in the 1D evolution models, so we use Mesa to generate this model of a red supergiant. Um, I, we didn't include any mass loss, but we only took from the model the overall radius and uh, the overall radius and core size of the red supergiant model and feed it into our simulations. Um, I'm not quite sure. It's um, a bit mysterious in red supergiants, is partly why I asked. I mean, they have sort of episodic blobs from observations. Which... Sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Was that on, on Zoom? Oh, sorry. Um, it's a bit mysterious for red supergiants. From observations, we think they just have episodic mass loss. So uh, random blobs. All right, thanks. My, yeah, but I think from the 1D stellar models, the uh, the mass losses are the, the mass loss is probably at least not dynamically important in the common envelope phase that we simulate anyway. So over the course of about 10 years, that's the duration of the spiral in the mass loss is probably much, much, much less than a, a solar mass. Hey, great talk. Um, I wanted to ask you, can you expand a little bit more about uh, how you do the engulfment simulation, like in the similar way as you did for the envelope, uh, common envelope one? Thanks. So in practice, again, the only difference is that um, the, the companion is also a gas sphere. So we made a separate dump file. We actually modeled, um, this is a hot Jupiter as a, um, as a polytrope, a polytropic sphere. And we've added it to the other other dump with using the binary mod dump option. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. Yes. I was just curious about your light curve because at least by eye, compared to the observations, it didn't look too bad. So I was wondering why you say it's over luminous. Like if I compare left and right there on those plots, they seem all right. So that's just trying to um, integrate the total energy that's released in the light curves. Like maybe the Ilya's making a comment about that, but it's already exceeding the, the total binding energy that's contained in the envelope. So it's, it's, it, it doesn't quite make sense. If you think about the, um, uh, the, the orbital energy uh, ultimately powering uh, uh, this event, I guess I'm curious, why does the left-hand side show the same thing then? I think Ilya has a comment. Yeah, exactly. So I was going to point out the scale, and I think the, 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 the thing that worries me, uh, sorry, I don't think I've actually seen this plot before, but the thing that would worry me when looking at this is actually the rise time, right? So I think your, your explanation of the, uh, the late time behavior, okay, you don't have cooling, so your envelope remains uh, hot and continues radiating, uh, um, makes sense. But what, what worries me is that the on the left, you're seeing these light curves rising very rapidly, right? You're looking at sort of, you know, a few days, maybe tens of days at most. On the right, in your simulations, you're looking at rise times of, of you're looking at years, right, uh, for the rise time, right? So that's two orders of magnitude difference, right? And I think this is actually the part that, that worries me because I think one of the questions is, um, you know, how do you get this thing out, uh, the luminosity out on a time scale of days? And I'm actually wondering whether the, in reality, the luminosity that's the sharp rise you see on the left is because of some sort of a shock breakout from material that hasn't, from when your uh, accretor hasn't yet gone anywhere deep in the envelope, when it's still in the outer stages of the, of the envelope and things can break out quite quickly at that point. And and that doesn't seem to be captured on the right. So I'm kind of curious whether we're really looking at, at the same behavior on the left and on the right. So another thing is that um, because we're simulating red supergiant, we do have much longer dynamical times or freefall time scales on the surface. Um, and whereas on the left, most of these events are, um, well, some of these are high-ish mass, but not as high mass as, as are, uh, what we've simulated. Most of these events don't actually capture the uh, the rise time, and a few that we have the rise time, I believe, come from low mass systems like for V1309 SCO, and some are mergers of less evolved uh, stellar objects, so not quite on the red giant branch, and so that could also explain why it has a, a quicker rise. Uh, 
All right, if there are no further questions, let's thank Mike again. So we're going to our first coffee break now.